Hey everybody, Nick here with the first ever Killing for Sport podcast. And I'm joined by my co-hosts, Logan. How's it going, Logan? I am stoked for this. This has been in the works for a few months. I cannot wait to talk about horror films. And Kevin. What is up? Uh, I am also very excited uh yeah let's let's get things going man i'm excited and last but not least chuck how's it going chuck pretty good how's everybody doing glad to be doing the show um i have always wanted to do a horror podcast this is a dream come true i'm i'm excited to be here so let's do this all righty and uh we'll go ahead and start with an icebreaker because we started this as a passion project with it being the month of October. And we'll go ahead and get started with, what was the first horror movie you ever watched? Start with you, Logan. Um, My mother said it was It and that it was Terrified. The original, obviously. Um, I don't remember seeing it when she says I saw it. I I remember seeing it later on. Um, The first one I actually remember watching was Child's Play. Um... But yeah, that's my backstory into horror. Kevin? All right, so let me start off by saying I'm probably about 10 years older than all of you guys. I, I am, <laughs> I'm like 38, approaching 39. Actually, my birthday is this month. Uh, more on that later, by the way. So anyway, uh, as far as I am aware, I think... Okay, the first horror movie I watched if you want to consider it, was, I believe, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> and I was probably like eight, and it did freak me out because I was an idiot, because I was eight. So uh, past that, though, uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I watched a lot of... Well, I say kid. When I was a, a, like a 13-year-old middle school, I, I watched a lot of like Friday the 13th stuff and... I was huge into that sort of thing. And ironically enough, interestingly enough, Candyman was a huge part of that. And again, more on that later. All right. And Chuck. My first horror film, I remember very vividly. It was uh, Friday the 13th, part seven, the new blood. Uh, My brothers had a tape. that uh, I think from, it was from cable TV. And on that same tape, right after uh, Jason 7, there was actually Nightmare on Elm Street 4. So that was my second horror film. But um, yeah, they introduced me to it, and I loved it. I was in kindergarten, actually. But uh, so Jason. I would say that the first horror movie I ever saw was um, Friday the 13th, Part 3 pretty sure it was late night and it was on spike tv <laughs> tnn at the time oh you got the commercials <laughs> yeah and i vividly remember the scene where <laughs> it's in the barn right yeah <laughs> and the black guy tries to shoot him And then they try um, to hang him as well. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely part three. Yeah. And it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, fun times. <laughs> Argu- arguably the best Friday the 13th film, in my opinion. Uh, I, I don't know. Just the, they, I, yeah, three they is played up, up there. so much three of the 3D three. stuff. It was such a yeah. It was such a fun romp. Um, I personally, for Jason films, because a couple years ago, Charles and I actually went and watched every single Jason movie. Mm-hmm. And, Except for eight, eight and ten. Couldn't couldn't do those ones. Well, we did. Aww. We did ten. We did ten. We did. We did. We skipped a little bit. Oh right. Uh, yeah. But I I remember we got to like the boat scene and and. 
an eight. And I was like, I'm I'm ready to not watch this anymore. So we just turned so, it off. Is that New <laughs> York? Eight. Yeah, that's New yeah, York. Yeah. Takes me. Oh, Manhattan is a great one. And and I I don't know. I have a, I have a soft spot for the later Jason movies just because they're they're just so ludicrous and like well Jason in space. Like, come on. <laughs> like, what yeah. is not to love about that? One of my favorite Jason scenes of all time is when um, the dude's trying to box him on top of the building. Yeah, that's a classic scene. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is, that's a gem scene from part eight. <laughs> now I, I, I kind of want to go back and, and watch eight. Like, it's corny, but it does have its good parts. Yeah. Oh. So, but that's not the reason why I we're here. <laughs> We are here to talk about Candyman, and we'll go ahead and get started with that. Uh, came out in 1992. I was two, so I, was I? did not. I was two as well. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I definitely did not watch this when it came out. I actually saw this for the first time last week. Now, um, my man. And all of these movies that we will be reviewing are movies that I am seeing for the first time. Right. <laughs> yeah, I understood that. Yeah. Uh, Can I just quickly say a, a, a fuck you? I was 12 when this movie came out. <laughs> uh, it actually, and it actually came out on my 12th birthday, October 16th, 1992. Oh, well, see it? So. Yeah, very ironic that That's awesome parents. The yeah. first movie that we're reviewing, like legit, came out on my birthday. Did you so see it on your birthday? Crazy. I did not. I, I oh, well, oh. no, I of course not. Nobody would let a twelve-year-old. I don't know. Maybe some irresponsible teenager would have let a twelve-year-old into this movie. But no, I, I saw it. Um, a friend of mine had rent, or his parents rather, had rented it. Uh, obviously on VHS. Uh, so I was probably still 12 at the time when, when this actually came out. And yeah, I watched it at a neighbor's house and and, and it fucking wrecked me, honestly. Because, yeah, this movie is a little intense for a 12-year-old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing the trailers like as a kid, like, order it on pay-per-view. Um <laughs> and like it was pretty terrifying like we'll talk more about it here shortly what i think about it but like as a kid it's definitely terrifying i could see that i think um i became pretty accustomed to horror movies when i was young it didn't exactly scare me but i do remember being pretty disturbed by uh some of the brutality like involving the the dog's head cut off because of course as humans we're, we're used to seeing humans being brutalized but then animals it's always people look at it differently but um, and it's, it's we, yeah, <laughs> and it's like the thought of somebody hiding behind your mirror. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Well, I get creeped out living out uh, here in uh, in in Castle uh, uh, Moore. You live on a lake. It's the perfect horror movie setting. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere. And voices. Yeah, I hear voices. People knocking on the windows. Yeah, something like that. Personal um, joke. Yeah. So, um, it had a budget of eight to nine million dollars, and the box office was twenty five point seven million dollars, which I would say, in terms of, that's a win. Yeah, I would say profit. That's a win. Yeah. Definitely profit. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, they made it, a, you know, a trilogy out of it. So I mean, yeah. well, I wouldn't necessarily dwell on the whole trilogy idea here. Yeah, but. <laughs> Now, so I guess he's talking about what's has, wrong with it. Has anybody seen any of the additional films, or no? I've seen two, Fair and I couldn't, I couldn't finish. You three. did see two? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I finished like, the third two. One. Two, I never really had an interest in, and then three was like direct to video. Now, so. question: I don't know if we should save this for the end or not. Um, <laughs> Is there, do they continue like from the first story or does it just keep going? Like just random. Um, like, is there any continuation? Maybe, maybe we should save it. Yeah. Pass it. But yeah, we'll, we'll save it. Um, anyways, 
so for the opening weekend of Candyman, it came in fourth place behind uh, Steven Seagal movie uh, Under Siege. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis in the uh, The Last of the Mohicans. Good one. <laughs> Keenan Thompson in uh, the Mighty Ducks. Yeah, Dots. yeah. Because <laughs> he was the only guy in that movie. Yeah, yeah. Nobody else mattered. Uh, <laughs> Candyman came fourth. Consulting, can, sorry, consulting, consenting adults uh, oh. with Kevin Spacey, which is ironic to think about now. Um, a, porno feature, a porno <laughs> featuring Kevin Spacey. It was not a porno. <laughs> 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 I believe it was some sort of adult thriller type thing. I don't know. It was Kevin Kline was in it. Thriller. Too, so it was it like eyes wide watch. shut? Hard to watch now. I don't know. I don't don't let's not go besmirching Stanley Kubrick's work. Eyes wide shut. That was that was his last movie, so maybe maybe it's saying a lot. Was that the Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman porno? Yeah. It wasn't a porno. <laughs> It was, it was a fine piece of cinema. <laughs> Funny side note to that, actually. Uh, I actually got to see that movie on its opening weekend. And the way it ties into this podcast is the reason that I saw that is because the Blair Witch Project was actually full. That theater was full and Eyes Wide Shut opened the exact same weekend. So, Were you disappointed? Uh I mean, I, I had a thing for Nicole Kidman, so I guess it wasn't all bad. But Understandable. No, no I actually did like that movie. I, 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 I joke, but I, I, I'm a Kubrick nerd, so it wasn't the best Kubrick movie, but it was a good film, I thought. Anyway, right. moving on. Uh, so for the password the, was Fidelio. Anyway. For the rating of the movie, you got a 6.6 6 on IMDb. And a 70, decent for 70 horror film. Yeah, but IMDb in general, you just can't trust. Yeah. Uh, I'd say they're both fair ratings. Yeah, 74% on alternate. Rotten Tomatoes. You got, I like all, I go between like IMDb and then I look at Rotten Tomatoes and then even uh, Metascore. It's pretty good. I think it's pretty fair. I think it was kind of in that spot if I had to rate it. Oh. So, I agree. We'll go yeah, ahead and, and get. I think- Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say it. I think it held, held up as well. So, I mean, even as a seven point whatever in the 90s, I, I think it actually still holds that today. I mean, I don't really feel like it uh, suffered from any yeah. sort of dating. No, yeah. Um... Pretty basic, like, practical gore effects. There was really only that one seeing that had digital effects at the you know with the bees on fire we can get to that but um but we can this movie was like pretty much of a uh, i mean it was a it was a gem for its time it's one of those rare 90s gems in that sort of session where there you can only find like a few good horror movies scattered about until it seemed to be revitalized by a screen this is one of the good ones though so would you say that the '90s were the dark times of horror movies? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, I mean there were some hidden gems, sure, but I mean yeah. it didn't really start kicking back off till like the late '90s when indie indie film really started rising back up. I mean, I mean you had in the '80s it was like just a plethora of just everybody just doing whatever they wanted. And releasing it in some cases, right. like you could, direct you could video. easily find a distributor. Yeah, it was so much stuff. And then, like in the early '90s, especially, it started really like like Charles was saying, it dried up. And Ooh. then towards the late '90s, there was like this sort of resurgence of independent cinema, and I think that's where horror really started kind of coming back up. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start talking about the movie itself. Um, it took place in Chicago, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. Was Candyman a Michael Jordan fan? <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll just have to ask Tony I'm, Todd. Um, somebody tweet I'm, at him. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that uh, considering the Candyman was a son of a slave and like around in the 1800s, probably not up on the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> well, yeah, that's okay. the only thing you live for. 
<laughs> what if the reason why Michael Jordan won so many ranks is because he he had Candyman do his bidding? It's possible. <laughs> And I, mean, you I don't can... remember any Boston Celtics getting slit up the <laughs> sternum or anything. So yeah, uh, but you can follow uh, Tony Todd on Twitter and ask him uh, his his favorite uh, moment as a Chicago Bulls fan as Candyman uh, at Tony Todd fifty four. Our main character, Helen, uh, graduate student researching urban legends, and hears about Candyman. Uh, skipping around a little bit she starts investigating and she starts talking to these two cleaning ladies was I the only person to notice she did not say it enough times when she when she started doing it like she so when the first cleaning lady right before the cleaning lady came in um, she was saying it maybe it doesn't count because it wasn't in front of a mirror but she didn't get up to five times, which I found interesting. Or maybe that was just a red herring. I don't know. Oh, you mean when the recording is on? Yes. Um, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you're not in front of a mirror. I, I guess it also matters who's you know who's doing it. If you're doing it to you, I guess that's how the legend works. I guess those are the rules. But um, I just found it lady... interesting. Yeah. Uh, when it was happening, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Because I was counting. She didn't get up to five. Um, was she afraid to? And that was like, um, even though she didn't believe, like she was still afraid to do it? No, she was, she was stopped. Like she, she, she was listening to the recording and then Right before it got up to five, the cleaning lady came in and she turned it off. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting touch. Like it's like I didn't really notice it until you mentioned. Yeah, that. I didn't pick uh, up on that either. I, me neither. It's a good eye. Let's see, um, so she hears more about like some murder in a project where I guess the one of the cleaning ladies lives. They take her friend uh, <clears throat> or her well cowork uh, sort of co-ed and they come down a place called Cabrini Green which is where Candyman lives well not lives but uh, the legend I mean she's very ambitious she's trying to she's taking all kinds of pictures and then uh, some lady meets them there she's a little apprehensive and then they start talking to her in her apartment and she tells her more about the lady just I think it's just a few apartments over who died Ellen's uh, very skeptical, skeptical about all this, and she keeps finding like different ways of how somebody could have gone and killed her because she doesn't believe in this legend. You remember that she starts think, having theories like, "Oh, somebody, you know, broke through the mirror," because she has like the same apartment building as the one that was in Cabrini Green, and then she found out that this little sort of plastic panel. Uh, separating them from the other apartment, you could just you could literally just crawl through it. Well, that's how the killer did it, and so she's kind of like breaking down the reality of this myth, and that'll go later into what you know I wanted to talk about with urban myths. But I mean, eventually, uh, so what what happens next, Nick? She's she's investigating, and you know, where do we go from there? Um, um, well, she meets the boy, right? Yeah. And he's he's telling her stories. And she starts talking about the... Um, what's the term in 2019 now? Um, intellectually disabled? Oh, right. Yeah. Is, is One of the things term? we heard about. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, he wanders into the bathroom mm -hmm. and supposedly Candyman gets him. Yeah, he kind of, he sort of cuts him on his groin is what they say. Yeah, cuts his dick off. All right. <laughs> we, can, we can cuss. We can cuss in this podcast. Okay. It's a horror movie podcast. Well, remember, one of the quotes from Candyman is, 
with my hook for a with my hook for a hand growing to your gullet. Yeah. So that's cool candy. So I, I I might be going out of order here, but I was also I'll admit I was while I watched the movie last night, I was ironing and I did miss part of the text and I I, I don't remember if it happened before or after this scene, when she had dinner with that other professor, and he was basically <laughs> retelling the the lore, effectively, of the Candyman. Mm-hmm. So I did miss some stuff, and I'm not sure. Have we? Uh, is uh, am I going out of order, or is that? Oh, is that I think the scene we, right yeah. after that, or the right before that. Middle of it. So yeah, you're you're right. Um, the they meet with this professor, and he writes all kinds of information on a. Uh, urban legends and he was going to visit uh you know he calls it candy man country he knows anything about candy man so he tells the story the or sort of uh like the, the lore and it's just this aims given there's no he just talks about how oh there was a man who was a son of a slave with uh, this white woman um, with whom, you know, he was uh, supposed to paint because he was an artist. And so, of course, Wiggins uh, were paid to chase him down and they cut off his hand, his uh, right hand, and smeared honey on him and all these bees came and stung him to death and then they burned him and scattered around uh, his ashes. Not, you know, we're not given a name. It's just, it's very, you know, vague. And we might not even know that actually happened. And I'm going to talk about that later. But that's what the myth is based on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. An artist. Um, she eventually gets assaulted by, I guess, a gang. There's this guy with a hook calling himself Candyman. He just hits her in the face with the hook. And she's kind of she's kind of left there to and this this we, we hear you're looking for Candyman, bitch. Right. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that was so funny. Yeah, yeah. But do in doing so, that guy gets so he gets arrested, and some of the murders get blamed on him. kid jake that candy man isn't real and i think like that starts like affecting the myth because people around cabrini green start to doubt it and disbelieve is that he where wants... the, uh, my congregation is right and then that's when uh candy man finally you know appears before her Ellen. Ellen. you know in, in the parking lot and he has the deadlights from from it he does. Yeah, he does something. He makes like, make flashes, and she like faints briefly. It's she's strange. like brainwashed. It's like tearing up. She's just infatuated, I guess. Uh, but, um... And then what? This is when the movie gets good. So I will say this. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yes. Y- y'all are feel free to to disagree. I'm totally fine with that because that's the whole point of this podcast is to discuss and debate to a certain point. <laughs> anyway, um, this had a very weird buildup for me. It wasn't a normal hor- horror movie. And I say that with the bar being in the likes of f- the Freddy movies, the Jason movies... It's just, it's different. Well, I mean, it's not a slasher flick. There's some slasher I mean, kind of, elements. There, but there are some not, elements, but it's, yeah. I mean, I would actually, it's funny because you, I remember talking to you offline and you had mentioned something about being a fan of the Hellraiser series or specifically the first Hellraiser movie. And I honestly feel like this shares a lot stylistically. And I know Clive Barker, okay, so there's there's that element that's shared but i feel like they do share some of the 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 feel as far as like a slow build it was yeah yeah so 
I mean, honestly, and I hadn't really seen all of the similarities because I hadn't, honestly, I had not seen Candyman in the last at least 10 or 15 years prior to last night. So, you know, going back into it after having seen, you know, Hellraiser a number of times, it really, like, the, the, the similarities just in, 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 like, kind of the style and in the score especially kind of reminded me of one another in that respect. But it's a horror so. film. It's a horror film with class, and there's a lot of, like you said, the music. Um, there's good acting, good uh, character development. Overall, it is. It's not a slasher film, and I thought the build up to it wasn't slow. I thought it was sure. It, I guess you could say it took show um, Candyman, but I thought it was worth it because it built up the urban legend aspect, and I thought that was fascinating. So right. it, it was yeah. even better when I saw Candyman. Well, to be fair with Hellraiser, I felt like the build-up was a lot better in Hellraiser. Yeah, there was a long build-up with Hellraiser, too. But there was there was death in it. Like, you got right to it. And the build-up, I felt like the build-up was worth it. Like, and not to say the build-up wasn't worth it for this, but I just felt like it was a lot longer. Or at least it felt a lot longer. Um, I can agree with that. So, but once we get to this point where we are in the movie... It's it definitely pays off, but I just felt like, man, oh, yeah. all this time. Thank God we're finally seeing this craziness. And, and well, I think I, one, yeah, go go ahead. Ahead. well, one of my favorite things about that was, you know, for the first, I guess, thirty to forty-five minutes of the film, you're seeing uh, Virginia Madsen's character. She's really just sort of studying the lore of everything and she's basically debunked everything and she's she said it in the mirror five times and nothing happens so you know then she runs into this guy that calls himself the candy man and again it's 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 all real world stuff there's nothing paranormal or supernatural about anything and then all of a sudden once we get to this point everything flips and it's just like oh shit the legend's real right yeah, once it hit, I mean, it was like action all the way to the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so we'll start... Sorry, I can't speak today. Start talking... It's about them, too, more than just Candyman. It's about them sort of as a... Kind of a, as a couple, almost, in a way. Sure. Well, yeah. and that's the other thing. I I really... And, and I don't know if anybody else has seen or saw the kind of similarities that I saw. Because, again, I hadn't watched... Candyman in probably 15 years or so. But I saw a lot of similarities between this and like American Psycho where didn't know if was... it was real or not. Yeah, exactly. Whether, you know, I mean, and I guess that's something that could be considered, you know, conversation for later as far as whether she that. was just absolutely batshit or if if it was the Candyman killing everybody, you know? So, I mean, and that's the thing about this movie that I guess I didn't really realize when I was, you know, 12 and watching it for the first time. But, I mean, it's it's the thing that really kind of made this movie stick out to me at, at an early age. And, 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 you know, to this day is so just outright setting the bar so high for horror. Um. So what was everyone's favorite scene or nick start with you this next scene that we're about to talk about okay all right yeah (laughs) um in which he he i guess he horse tranquilizes her i don't know anyway so she she passes out (laughs) she's knocked the fuck out (laughs) yeah and she wakes up in um the projects the same lady she talked to yeah uh, that was that was nice earlier yeah. right and his and and is, is that his jacket that was covered on top of her i don't think so oh okay it looked similar but i wasn't sure so she has a knife and she's hearing screaming she goes in the first thing you see is the dog's head cut off yeah Oof. it that looks pretty real. traumatizing it looks real too yeah very real that held up pretty well. Blood's everywhere. Yeah. 
and I'm like, oh shit, things are getting started finally. I just wanted to say that dog head was more convincing than the head that was kicked and rolled across the ground in uh, Logan. Yeah, agreed. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So That's, she goes go in ahead, and the baby's missing and the mother's first, screaming. First you don't know you don't know if the baby was there or not. You you think he might have killed the baby. Yeah. Well the baby's not okay, so the point is the baby's not there. The mother's screaming. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh the mother comes at her. There's a knife. And then the kid the kids the the cops run in. And she's arrested. And she's she's basically treated like a criminal by the same cop that uh, helped her out um, when the fake Candyman got her. You wonder, like, what happened? Did he take her there? He put her there and then took the baby? Like, what? Why yeah. did he take the baby? To lure um, her in there? I think, yeah, it was to lure her to him. Because there, there are a lot of questions in the movie where they they don't really answer them. They're just kind of there, like some things happen mm. without explanation. I think because he shows her visions of, of where the child is, and then he it, and then she hears it in that uh, you know bot that um, that pile of junk where the where the bonfire is. Yeah, yeah. But, um, Okay, so after that scene, she it's a horrible scene too. She's all bloody. She has to like they have to check her crevices and whatnot. Pretty disturbing, but um uh, she gets out on bail. Um she's at her house and uh there's one of the most one of the scariest parts I think is um she goes up to the mirror and he she closes it and he punches his hook through the mirror. At her. I jumped. I jumped actually. <laughs> right. And then he's like making all these <clears throat> grunting noises trying to <laughs> trying to get her, right? <laughs> they were overly excessive. <laughs> Every time he kills somebody, he makes this sort of grunt noise. Um but uh he runs outside of her room or of her apartment, and then he's standing there. And she runs back inside and he's there. Again, he starts, she's like hypnotized again to where she's just drowsy. She falls on the ground and he starts telling her that this belief has destroyed the faith in my congregation and now I must kill you. And he says, I have the child. Allow me to take you. And then uh, that does creep me out is when uh, the door opens and a friend is, uh, hears this. The, her Helen, uh, Virginia Madsen's character, and she comes inside and then the door slams and she turns around and Candyman's there. He just doesn't say anything to her. He's just staring at her. You just, you don't even uh, see it happen, but he just starts to kill her too. And you hear that, that grunting again as he's like, I guess just slashing her with his hook. Oh, oh, oh. Right. <laughs> How he's just staring at her like that. The whole time, I'm just like, don't go in, don't go in. Uh, um, so then she gets committed. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah, this Candyman is, yeah. is basically gaslighting her mm -hmm. and making her look crazy. Yeah, you particularly, is... yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say this, this upcoming is probably the best in the whole movie. Yeah. Like these next five to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You particularly like this scene, uh, too, Nick. I remember. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, so they <laughs> they strap her up. He said he's the dog. He's what? Oh, no, you go ahead. What was what, no, what, what was the thing you said? I said, I said you, were, you were saying, is he raping the dog? Uh, so. uh, well, before <laughs> that. Before that. So. <laughs> right, right. He's. There's more, yeah. He's. She's strapped to the gurney, and suddenly 
he comes down like it's Mission Impossible, and he's Tom Cruise, and he just starts talking about this crazy shit that doesn't make any sense. I can't remember what he said. Should have wrote that down. Something about his congregation does not believe him in believe in yeah. him anymore. And I didn't know what the fuck he was saying, yeah, but it was I, funny. Right. <laughs> well, I, I think that the whole thing is no. So so here's here's where I think that, that came from. She had the 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 candy man that was running around calling himself the candy man locked up. So as a result of him be- being locked up, everybody thought they were safe, so he didn't have anybody to terrorize, I guess. So I think that's oh, re- really, yeah. Yeah, because there's, yeah, nobody, what he was, there's yeah. nobody out there saying Candyman, Candyman, Candyman like they were before because they all think that there's no need to do it anymore. Yeah. So he has no way to be summoned. And it could be different people, too, like committing different, you know, sort of, strange um murders or brutal murders under strange right. circumstances that any anyone could just say that was candy man right so yeah so then um, yeah. she's screaming she gets put under and she then visits the psychiatrist oh who yeah. basically tells her she's been in the loony bin for a month and he, he basically dares her to bring him so there coincidentally is a mirror right there so while she's strapped down in a wheelchair she looks and says Candyman five times and suddenly um Candyman starts raping the doctor well, at first you th- <laughs> at first you think it might <laughs> I'm fairly certain it was not a rape was it consensual? because it sure didn't look like I don't... it it, <laughs> it was an unconsensual murdering yeah I mean, it was a, it was a murder. <laughs> they there was were not, a hook. They were not. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that the hook didn't go in his ass. I'm not going to say it didn't. Uh, sure yeah, looked like yeah. it. <laughs> and the sounds he was making too. I I still don't understand. Ugh. 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 I wonder <laughs> if that is supposed to be like semi-sexual sound. Like I don't know. <laughs> you know. But oh, okay, going back though. At first, you do think like. Up, I thought when I well when I first saw the movie, I remember. Well, I mean, sure. It's, I mean, you're yeah. buying into the theory that that Helen is crazy and that she's just making mm-hmm. the whole thing up, and then all of a sudden, boom, he's there. And yeah. I don't. And I think she said it to. I maybe even proved to herself that he didn't exist. And then suddenly, right. yeah, I guess he's helping her escape. Right, like yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and that's so, the thing you I mean, gotta wonder, like, if if, yeah. if she really thought that he was gonna come help her, like when that happened, she wouldn't have screamed, would she have? Like, but exactly, but no, she did. Yeah. She shrieked, and then it was and, like, and oh, it kinda, shit, yeah. time to go. <laughs> it sort of does also conflict with the theory that you know. I remember people used to talk about it on IMDb about a. Uh, it, it kind of plays with you back and forth that she actually might be the killer and she's just crazy. But how did, you know, gotten out of those restraints and, and killed the doctor if she actually was supposed sure. to have been killed? I mean, there's no Unless way. Some orderly just did a shitty job restraining her. But... Right. Yeah. True. Yeah. Um. So he lets her free. So she jumps out the window. And somehow makes it back to her apartment. Remember, he flies back. Yeah. Oh, that was the that was the yeah. best part. He f- <laughs> he somehow gets his uh, Mission Impossible <laughs> gear back and just flies right out of the <laughs> out of the window. And she's like, "Well, I guess I'll follow him." And she ends up back at the, the apartment. Part. Yeah. Yeah way back there nobody uh finds her yeah well you know what i found interesting is that the husband is played by the same guy who played the dickhead um director in 24 in one of the the first couple seasons i didn't know that yeah 
just it just reminded me of him being a dick to uh, Jack Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> just a little little fun fact there for you. Admit, yeah. Um. <laughs> so you know, do we want to start talking about the uh, the bees? <laughs> yeah, the. I mean, the bees are just part of the. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Um, so, <laughs> a uh, couple of quick things on the bees, just real quick mm-hmm. from my perspective. Uh, a, uh, part of the reason that this movie freaked me the fuck out when I was 12 is that I was and still am sort of afraid of bees. And also, I did read an article uh, from The Guardian that was actually from June of this year where they actually interviewed Tony Todd, apparently he got a thousand dollar bonus for every bee sting he incurred during the filming of this film. And uh, apparently he got about 23 bee stings during, during the filming. So, so we got $23,000. Yes. $23,000. Apparently. uh, So the bees in his mouth, he was wearing a dental dam at the time. So, Good on them for not allowing bees to go down his throat or anything. So cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that I thought that, and, and yes, they were real bees, obviously. But uh, I don't know. I didn't actually. I, maybe it's in the article. We can post this article lady uh, later. Uh, but I didn't see anything about Virginia Madsen getting any sort of bee sting bonus. Uh, oh, I'm sure she did. She was pretty fucking covered in bees at a point. And, yeah, that uh, makeout scene. <laughs> well, you know, you know really what, I think the scariest B scene for me was the toilet. Oh, the toilet! <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that coming. I thought that, like somebody was going to pop up or something, but it was just bees. It, the and, thing, with right? The and that toilet. that was early in the film uh, when she was investing, or she was going into that bathroom where that kid was was yeah. murdered, and she was just sort of going back in. And we guess we should mention that's how the movie opened was with the bees. True. Hey, the thing with the toilet was. Um, like if if she slammed that thing down, wouldn't the bees be swarming the hell out of that bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> but maybe hey, maybe that wasn't really there. Maybe that was only for her to see it. It wasn't. Or, or maybe there. she in, invented the whole. Thing. Or right, right. Maybe it was all in her yeah. mind. Maybe right, the candy man was only at. only presenting it to her. Right. So what was what was up with the fecal matter as well? Like somebody just decided <laughs> they're just going to spell uh, out literal shit literal. on the uh, on the walls. Yeah. Since we're talking about yes, please. Since we're talking about the urban myths part of Candyman. Let's let's just let's just get on it. All right. This is my theory of what Candyman actually is. Um so okay, so the Candyman itself is was never real he he or it is not actually real it is the, the myth only through the word of mouth and literally writings on the wall as established before with apparently with sh- uh, pieces of fecal matter so like the words uh you know sweets to the sweet that is the i guess well, and uh the murals are what keep him alive you know, like in that room she's in, there's this pieces of candy with the razor blades in it. Feedy of his head, just in that sort of secret room. Locals in Cabrini Green are afraid of it. And, uh, you know, when Helen goes to the Cabrini Green for her study, there's, you know, such events that, like we said, uh, that unfold that lead to the uh, myth of Candyman being in danger. And then the cop pinned the murders on that guy with the hook. She convinces the kid, Jake, who probably reflects the other residents, uh, the, uh, the, he reflects the sentiment of the other uh, people who live there that Candyman might not be real. Myth of Candyman, not Candyman, but the myth is in danger of disappearing or dying. It, as the myth, I'm going to say myth a lot, unfortunately, it's going to materialize into some sort of, you know, physical 
partly, you know, physical apparition powerful enough to kill people in order to revise itself and secure its place in society. So even he says himself, he gives, you know, hints of this, that he's the writing on the wall, the whisper in the classroom. Um, a thing about, you know, whether he was a real person or not, it's very, the story behind him is very vague. Matter. Um, what we see in front of us, what Helen sees, is a figure of a man who was supposedly killed in the late 1800s, but it's not actually any kind of spirit or ghost of a man. It's simply just a, a myth that was represented by the word of mouth, graffiti, that has materialized itself because it's in danger. Right? That's kind of what I thought. So, killed the lady in that apartment in the projects. Well, like, like I said, Helen already figure out, figured out the killer could have come from a mirror. You might say, well, what about that kid clutching his groin in the bathroom? Well, that was just a matter of he said, she said. We didn't even know if that actually happened. You know, it was a brutal attack by someone else. So part of what kept Candyman myth alive in Cabrini Green were that there were, you know, there were other people killing people at the time in the name of Candyman. So is that what kept the myth of Candyman alive? Yeah, that, and then people spreading rumors about it, talking about it, uh, doing you know graffiti on the wall. It always kept, I mean, it kept that fear of a Candyman. So, so like the beginning scene, um, you know, when they're about the bone, and she's like, yeah, telling him all that, and then he goes downstairs and she gets killed. Is that just all, uh, just a story of? I mean, just a made-up yes. story. Remember, it's a um, or just says, a, a myth. Yeah, it's part of the urban. It's it's just another sort of block or just piece of that uh, that keeps that urban myth myth alive. So right, right. So it may have never happen. We have no proof yeah. one way or the right. other. That or, makes sense. Uh, yeah, the girl at the beginning telling the story. She says, oh, my friend knows him. So it's, you know, it's basically like, oh, my, my cousin's best friend's stepmom's father knew when this happened. It's basically that, that same kind of thing that he said, she said, again. Gotcha, gotcha. Sure, I mean, well, but there was still a person who died. I mean, it was Ruthie Jean, and there was a newspaper yeah. article about it. So, I mean, it definitely warranted some investigation, which brought... Helen to that apartment to begin with. So, right. I think that was the main one that was keeping the story alive. And Helen now got it, you know, to be pinned or she made it. So it was then pinned on that guy with the hook, with the leather jacket and the hook. So moving on, <laughs> um, we can go ahead and start talking about, should we continue where we left off where he flew out of the, yeah. Yeah. Flew out of the room. Right. So yeah. Yeah. he meets the husband in the apartment and, and you know she has a, he has a new woman. Yeah. Yep. And how does that how does that end? <laughs> he <laughs> throws the paint at the wall and uh, And they're painting the house like this pinkish gray i don't even know color and she she actually makes a comment about that and then confronts them and all and then uh she leaves and so they run to and she goes back to cabrini green how does she get there train or teleports can candy the only, teleport, only thing i can way? figure is that it's very close to the prison or the uh, asylum, or whatever she escaped from. Okay, yeah. I guess, yeah. Um, so she goes and confronts Candyman, and he's in this uh, sort of upper level in an abandoned building, and wakes up, and she sticks him with a hook and you know it does nothing but it, it makes kind of blood splatter out and that's when the most in comes where um, well first he's talking about how uh, he's going to eventually kill her and how it's going to be it's going to be an amazing experience to be you know to 
legend or he doesn't say exactly that, but she says she's afraid of dying and, and she fears what's going to happen. And that horrific part with the, with the bees comes to, and he, he opens up his coat and he just has like a, a rib cage, rib cage full of just bees inside or on top of it at least. <laughs> It's favorite scene, right, Nick? It it actually didn't disturb me that much. Because I sent you a gif of that scene, and you said, "Well, in context, you know, in context, it. it didn't bother me as much." Okay. First, you're like, "Fuck that! I'm not," or "Screw that! I'm not watching this movie now." Hey, we can cuss. It's okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Oh. <laughs> um you know, go ahead. Yeah, I you know, this movie definitely did not bother me as much as I thought it would. I was more disturbed by them making out with bees in their mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, maybe maybe you should kink shame people, Logan. <laughs> maybe maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's what I'll do. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> we just found Logan's new thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> so uh, we can go ahead and, you know, move towards the end with the pile of furniture that's going to be used as a uh pyre yeah. in the ghetto. Sorry, projects. Um and <laughs> She yeah. hears the, the baby screaming in there. Why why the baby's in there, I don't yeah. know. This is this is after the bees and Yeah. So he, he brings the baby there, I guess. Yeah, so she goes, finds the baby, and then he attacks her. He grabs her and the kid Jake sees he got some good vision because from his window he could see the woman like you can see her hand with the hook, like into the rubble, and saw his hook. Let's get him! And you know he was pretty far away. I don't know how you could see that in the, in the dark. And but observation. So he's got good vision. That's all. It's <laughs> young. <laughs> um. So then they all just, all the, the residents, uh, they burn the pyre and they, they think Candyman's there. They say, and I guess technically he is. I wasn't sure exactly what was happening because he wanted her and I guess the baby too to like to burn in the pyre and just die. And what, what was that accomplishing? Does anyone well, I don't think that they realized that the baby was part of that because I mean, it, it, oh, yeah, they, towards yeah. the end, I mean, Helen crawls out with the baby and they seem super yeah. appreciative that she had the baby yeah. and was giving it back. But I mean, like candy man, like why yeah, does that, that want to burn? But, no, I was completely confused plan? about that as well, but like, did I he want them all to die maybe some sort of a symbolic thing where they were actually like, that was Finally his family putting an end to Candyman for some reason. Yeah. yeah, I don't know exactly what it was about, but the baby did not seem to factor into the pyre. Yeah. The baby was just there. <laughs> he had it the whole time. Yeah, uh, and so the she survives, but obviously she's burnt to a crisp. And then suddenly but, she's she's dead. She died pretty well. I mean, Did she's she like survive? it looks like she it looks like she passes out and then she probably died. You know, I guess she could have died later in a burn. Yeah, that's what I think just... happened. I mean, I don't think she survived the entire ordeal. I think she survived just long enough to return the baby, and then mm -hmm. I guess it was lights out for Helen at that point. But yeah, I don't. I guess we don't really know. Yeah. It's sort I, of unclear exactly when she died, but it was fairly soon after that. Yeah. Regardless, it's not that big of a deal, like whether she died at the hospital or or whatever. Yeah, I think also, yeah. I so, think also since people actually believed he was in there, um, 
then he, tr- I guess that means he just really was. And so they believe they killed him because I think everyone saw the bees. Cause then there was this burst of, of bees that were on fire coming out of the pyre. Right. Remember? Yeah. Right. And I think people saw that because they're reacting to it. And then they showed Candyman's burning body, you know, him, him being gone or disappeared. It looks like he was now willed, I don't know, into now truthfully finally dead. And then that's what goes into, you know, talk about, um, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so so basically then she turns into a candy woman. (laughs) Yeah, the... the, Yeah, the the tits. Cabrini Green, excuse me, they they come to her funeral and who were there at the bonfire and they drop... And see, it was it was Candyman's hook that they had. It wasn't the hook she was holding. It was Candyman's hook because that had all the screws in it. Dropped that into her grave. Was that the final touch that made her Candy Woman? Yeah, I, I think so. I, that's how sure. I saw it. Like when the hook was in there and she was buried with it. Like that's what made her spirit yeah. come back as Candy Woman. Right. Uh, I mean, well, there was also that and the whole jilted lover thing. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, there's really no conclusion to it. Like, not really. I mean, we'll never really know. I think ultimately there is a theory. Well, or I guess there could be a theory that she, uh, she was, her her death was not necessarily warranted. As in, she was she was sort of. Not necess- she wasn't the uh, the the villain that she was perceived to be originally. So mm. now she is. I, well, that, I, I, now she, I'm confused because I'm thinking about it. Now she kind of is the villain now that, in, in like in the tough. afterlife, even though she wasn't the villain <laughs> in real life. So then again, I guess neither was uh, neither was the Candyman. So Candyman like, was not he, an antagonist. That's what my next well, question was going to be. I mean, so I guess during the the duration of the film, yes, he was, but in life yeah. he was a sympathetic character because I mean, I mean, let's be honest, all he was doing was like looking for love, right? Like he he was yeah, yeah. he was courting the wrong guy's daughter. So <laughs> exactly. yeah, that's the other he, thing. Ultimately, he paid the price for falling in love with the wrong person. Whereas, I guess in the same respect, you know, Helen paid the price for following down uh, this path rabbit trying hole, to uh, yeah yeah she she went down the rabbit hole and and was ultimately fighting the candy man and and whether she was the villain or the victim here is 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 hell that's the really the question yeah. of the movie right like yeah <laughs> yeah I, i'm thinking it's <clears throat> the Cabrini Green, again, the residence that was uh, Helen, and make her into this, this like this spirit or I, I mean, it, it seems so. I mean, she returned the baby, but at the same time, uh, right, like uh, when they put that hook in there, like they had this angry looking look on all their faces too. Like I don't know, it was I don't know weird. what they think, yeah. Like, right, because I mean, is it is she the protector of Cabrini Green? No, I mean that does that seems counter to like they thought <laughs> the they, whole mythology, yeah. right? Like, right, because they still could have thought, well, she took the baby in the first place, so she's not. She's well, just, oh, no, she... I, well, there then, then that that that's that's kind of a question there. Did she take the baby, or did Candyman take the baby, and then she returned the baby? And now that's sort of just clear to everybody. That, there's a lot of kind of questions that weren't really answered. So this goes back to what I asked earlier. On in the sequels, <laughs> is there any follow up? Okay. I'm assume no. In the sequel, at the uh, second one, the very beginning, they mention Helen. 
actually that explains the origins of candy man in the first one he is doing a presentation um and he it shows like a newspaper clipping it shows helen's face and he says uh, this is helen lyle He's, some people believe she was the candy man to the next slide so it mentions her real briefly so she's not oh, okay. candy woman in candy man two and three well, that's the problem with Candyman 2 and 3. The reason why they exist is because the first one did well, so the producers wanted another. And what they did was... So if they actually they do do this sequel, I wonder if we'll actually get a real follow-up. I would hope so, yeah. And the, um, the sin with 2 and 3 is uh, they relegate Candyman to an actual, like, just a mystical, you know... Um, malevolent force he's now actually spirit or a, a vengeful ghost of a man that was killed and and they go so far as to they give him a name they go oh, he has family members that are still alive they, they even show a scene of him be, with his hand being cut off and does, it just destroys the mystery for me sorry do they turn it more into a slasher like in two and three yeah, yeah. So right. it's totally watered, totally watered down. Yeah. Candy Woman does not exist in two and three. <laughs> no, no, she doesn't come back. So they yeah, as I understand, retconned. the mythology is done. So all this happened for no reason. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing is, <laughs> they, why, they, and, yeah, they, and, and, I mean, there is a reason, but I. But I think that's why, in in a lot of ways, I when when it was asked earlier, that's why I haven't seen. Uh, two, three. two or three, because they didn't really seem yeah. necessary at that point. I feel like you know the, the the first film really just summed everything up enough, and it told a full exactly. complete story. And, and and like Charles was saying, it basically was a cash grab because the producers saw the you know the dollar signs in their eyes, and you know it's don't get me wrong, I think Tony Todd deserves all of the money in the world. He was a fantastic villain. He was. Uh, or anti-hero, I guess, in, in some respects, you could say. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The, the other thing they did, just real quick, they they also completely, like, set it. Because in 2 and 3, it's now in New Orleans. Candyman was from New Orleans, Louisiana, and not Illinois, Chicago. What in the which, world? Historic, historically, that doesn't make sense, because... Free men in the South at that time weren't, you know, there weren't like many pockets for success as there were in the in the North. So it makes sense he would be like a, he would come from a rich family in the North because there were, doesn't it make sense that he would be in like the deep or peripheral South um, as like an artist yeah. at that time. Right. So it's, it's just stupid. Yeah. So I guess we should mention actually how it ended with him being in the bathroom and the girl cooking with her tits out. <laughs> and the Come in. Candy oh, candy. oh yeah, she's not wearing a bra. All you oh. see is tits the whole scene. <laughs> yeah. Disappointingly, she does not make the. Ugh, ugh, <laughs> ugh so I mean, I guess well, no, what does. I kind of don't understand is what, what what was the husband's name, Trevor or? I think Trevor, really yeah, Trevor. He, I guess, what the, what was his point? Why was he like? I mean, I, I get the guess the first couple of times, him saying Helen, Helen was just you know, grieving in a way. But then he turns off the light mm. and he's like, "What tempting fate? Like, what the fuck are you doing?" Fake <laughs> I don't even, I don't understand to... why that was necessary. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it as a plot device, sure, but it just, it didn't seem like something natural. For that character to do at that moment, no. Other than maybe to, com- yeah. I guess, I think kind of complete swore. the whole urban legend yeah. theory, but you know, it, it just, it didn't. The only thing it really was... started to do was potentially set up a sequel, I guess. Yeah, but, uh, and that's I, I what I, when, when I saw that scene, that's what I thought. I thought like in number two, like that's what would lead to that, but I guess it didn't. It just happened <laughs> to happen. Doing it. Yeah, he's just doing it to humor himself in a time of sadness or need. I, I don't know. Yeah. Not sure. Yeah, I think he was just initially just saying her name and then he... Any man thing. So 
Maybe he exactly give started it a shot. To... See what happens. I mean, I mean, he just moved to humor on, though. He was like yeah. with another girl at that point, so it's not like he he didn't seem to really have a whole hell of a lot of remorse for Helen, considering how quickly he moved on. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. It, it that's the only. I don't get me wrong. I love this movie. That's the only part that didn't totally add up for me. So, yeah, that's kind of what bothered me at the end was just that there I had a lot of questions more questions than answers at the end but overall it was a good movie so it was her killing now sorry go ahead um anything no, else uh, wait. Well, I had one more question so on the Candyman 2 cover when you google it there's a female on there yeah that is the one you're referring to that's supposed to be his big great niece or something oh <laughs> yeah okay so that goes back to the family thing you were saying okay that makes sense yeah because when i first saw that last night now i was a little tired after i watched it but i thought that might have been hell and i was like oh okay so they're gonna right. yeah. i was like okay i got interest in seeing number two and then you told me <laughs> that it has nothing to do with it whatsoever <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they they changed the whole history, like the, the setting, everything. Well, That's, I mean, so so just and, and I don't know if anybody else did any of the research on this, but I so the 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 movie itself is based on a Clive Barker short story called The Forbidden, which is actually revolving around the uh, the British caste system in Liverpool. So it's it it has really no roots in the U.S. or slavery or inner city Chicago mm-hmm. or anything like that. So the, the the director Bernard Rose he adapted it to encompass those I guess more American concepts or uh, ideals. And, and it was uh, historically accurate the first one. Like oh the, sure, the, yeah, I mean he did a great job a, of it. Like but a, but overall the original story, story had nothing to do with any of that. It was an adaptation. So yeah. Um. I also, because it's like a general commentary on urban legends, I can't help but think some of that, you know, came from. You say Bloody Mary three times in the mirror, and she sure supposedly she'll come out. I mean, obviously, it's. I think it's based on that. That that's from uh, Europe, I believe. Or what about uh, Sam Biggie Smalls five times? <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe we could end on like what what do you guys rate it a 10 or 5 I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with where IMBD had it oh oh you mean out of 5 right. out of 10 I'll say I'll say out of 10 since that's what a lot of those are doing so I'll go I'll go a 6 mm. I don't I mean, think like, it was bad but I don't think it was the greatest I've seen either yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, decent. I, I it was like good, like yeah. Six, six or seven's a fair. Yeah, personally, I'd put it at about an eight. And I mean, again, I think a lot of that is because, again, the time in which I saw it. I mean, again, I probably saw it well before I probably should have seen it. <laughs> right. Uh, and, but <laughs> overall, I mean, it has had such a lasting effect on me, and it it really has. It, it's just such a really good movie I, it, and, and I just when I think of horror films and like my history with horror films this movie just really jumps out as like one of the things that defined horror for me you know it, while growing up I, I, I clearly remember watching this movie at my friend's house going home and this is the stupidest thing but I remember it my mom made tomato soup for dinner that night <laughs> and it was close enough to where I was just like, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm not going to eat dinner. And my mom was pissed, and I, I went to bed without eating. <laughs> but, it, it, yeah, it, it, the fact that that sticks with me, like, 20, 30 years later. God. Anyway, uh, but, yeah, the fact that all of that sticks with me, it tells me how, how powerful this movie really is. And maybe it was just a me thing. I don't know, but... I really, I, I like, I love this movie. It's, it's, it's part of my horror biography. It's a real smart 
aging is uh you gotta think about it yeah yeah so uh closing thoughts oh oh um by the way i give it a uh, i give it a 6.5 <laughs> oh cool so like i will say what, what i'm thankful for on this podcast is i kind of like it's it's cool that i had no background knowledge of you guys um you kind of helped me understand this movie a little more than i did last night when i watched it for the first time um i it makes a lot more sense to me now than it did like because i went into it like not knowing what kind of movie it would be because somehow this is a horror movie that i've never seen before out of all the horror movies i don't know why i just i never watched it and um you know seeing it for the first time i was expecting like a slasher type and a lot of things didn't make sense but looking back on it what you guys explained it makes a lot of sense now yeah so one thing i think that we probably would be remiss to kind of point out is there from a racial really let's just be honest from from that perspective there were, were a lot of uh, uh sociological things implied in this film from the fact that she was a uh a graduate student studying urban legends in the inner city as a as a white woman it, it like like for its time 1992 nobody was touching stuff like that nobody not like not not in any films really right so the fact that you know the, the the horror movies and and, and i you know even though i i kind of dismissed it a little bit earlier is you know not being super from the uh the, the clive barker sh- or or being derived from and not an a, a, a like a a literal adaptation of the clive barker work Bernard Rose really took a lot of gambles here. I mean, one of the things that I was also reading uh, early on, like the original location, they actually filmed at Cabrini Green, which is a an actual housing project yeah. in inner city mm-hmm. Chicago. At the time when they were filming this, like the crew, when they originally went to do the filming, they were not allowed there without a police escort. So, I mean, oh, wow. it's it's crazy to think you know, how culturally relevant and, you know, watching this film at such an early age, I mean, just the, the, the sociological impact of the movie, uh, the, the things that were not particularly said, but, you know, I mean, her, her, uh, Bernadette, I believe was her name, the, you know, the fact that, you know, she was kind of leading them as they went into the, uh, into that project saying, Oh, we look like cop, you know, the, these whole, just, just those little things that, that kind of made this movie kind of pop out, uh, as opposed to, you know, your traditional slasher. I mean, I really, that, that's why I kind of gave this one an eight out of 10 rather than, than, a, than a lower thing. Cause it, it was more than just to me, a, uh, a, a timepiece horror. Like it, it's, it's, or a, I'm sorry, a place in time or, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it speaks louder than that to me. So I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit passionate about that, but I, uh, I feel it was like a, it, it could be uh, categorized as a few different genres. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and just one last point I want to make, I, I, we, we did point out at the very top of the episode where it released uh, in, in, at that week in 1992, uh, Dr. Giggles was oh, released no. the following week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't believe it did anywhere near as well as oh, no. the Candyman, no. but I have no idea. So <laughs> I just wanted to point that it's, out um, for 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 relevance in the horror community. That is what the Candyman was up against: the Doctor Giggles. Right. Yeah. There, there's also a little bit of social comment. There's some social commentary too, like uh, when Helen gets hit. Right. The cop. They call the cops and you know swept that in that entire project whereas you know they took like they had this ridiculous response time to to uh go to um that that lady was killed when they talked about that lady being killed disparity of how you know they'll treat like a grad student from a more upscale area than 
you know, someone in a project. Um, my thoughts on this movie, uh, I fascinated in um, looking at urban legends and then um, as I was, I was analytical uh, approach and I just, that's when I came up with what I thought, okay, what is really candy man? Cause I never could explain it myself. I, and then I just, it hit me. So the myth itself is real and that that's where I, you know, lock my, that was my launch pad. So uh, I kind of, I liked this movie even more um, from having seen it just recently. So well, I believe that you have to look at it from a different perspective now that you're like reviewing movies like that. So it's kind of like you see like the bigger picture of the movies. Mm. Also, I, um, I want to put out there, though, this is probably the, one of the only movies in the genre that we're going to have to do that sort of social commentary digging. Because well, yeah. let's be honest, <laughs> the horror genre is not known for its social commentary. Yeah. Right. Only until recently, pretty much. So, closing thoughts? I enjoyed it. I can't wait for episode two. Yeah, and we will be covering Sleepaway Camp, uh, which oh, Kevin... Oh, I'm so uh, excited. Kevin nice. has stressed to me that I cannot research this movie before I watch it. Yeah, yeah no. No, no. No spoilers. If anybody spoils Nick on this, I, I will say my name three times, five times, whatever. <laughs> Actually, don't no, don't say it at all. Just Nick, if anybody spoils it to you, give me their name, and I will candy man the shit out of them. Are you gonna go? Ugh, uh, 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 I mean, uh, I'm not. I, I'm not opposed to it. I won't write anything off. But thank you for, uh, thank you for... Uh, listening to our first ever episode. Uh, any, any any last words, guys? Before I kill you. I uh, had fun. This is this is good. I enjoyed it. I heard you looking for Candyman, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, close it. We're done. Okay. <laughs>